Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Pope from uh, Solarflare Communications. I'm here to uh, tell you about the Open Onload project. Um, I thought I'd start with uh, a couple of interesting dates from the history of local area networking um, and a bit of a history revisionism lesson. So um, Ethernet, this year, is 35 years old. Um, ben, the memo in 1973, Bob Metcalf wrote, started off the whole, uh, whole revolution, as it were. And then 2006, um, Ethernet's now running four orders of magnitude faster, 10 g base T, and uh, Solarflare sampled its first 10 g base T phi in August 2006, just a couple of months after the standard was ratified. So that allows me to get my one and only product placement out of the way. I can breathe easy now. Um, and then for a bit, of his, a bit of revisionism, so I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the picture at the top is not Ethernet. It's actually the Cambridge Ring, which is another local area network which was invented at about the same time as, as Ethernet. And I guess the point is that you know, everybody thinks about Ethernet over the years. It's obviously been the big dominant local area network, but there have been lots and lots and lots of others. You know, some, like ArcNet, for example, are in, in use today. So really, in one sense, local area networking has been a bit of a parallel set of parallel universes over the years. You know, we've all watched the Golden Compass, and everyone's going between the different universes. Um, so I've, I've drawn this chart here showing the step changes of, of Ethernet speed. This is the base T steps of Ethernet over time. So that's the, the blue line with a step function. Um, you know, going from 10 megabits up to 10 gigabits. And then the dotted line is showing the performance of what I term to be the R&D, or the high-performance compute network of the time. So over the left, you know, you've got FDDI and an ATM, ATM 622 megabits. And then Sonet uh, technologies, so there'd be the Atomic Project, for example, that was turned into Miranet, Miracom. And then later on, um, you've got InfiniBand over here. Um, and so, of course, you know, and there are, there are lots more. And, and um, you know, I'm not even going to attempt to, to name the, all of the, all of the H, high-performance high compute research efforts over, over the years. But one of the, one of the common features of that whole R&D high-performance compute effort, um, well, first of all, it, it's, it's been in common use. I mean, it's in production for an awful lot of places, these sort of networks. But secondly, over time, they've very much challenged the I.O. bandwidth of the machines which they've been plugged into. And that's, that, that's meant that the, the, um, the guys involved in those networks have been pushing network architecture. And they've been at the bleeding edge of network architecture right the way through the last 20 or so years. Um, certainly for the last 10 years, the picture on the slide here kind of gives, gives what constitutes um, what I'd call the bleeding edge of network architectures. And, and, and that very much is that the, um, you know, starting with the network adapter at the bottom, the network adapter provides a protected virtualized interface which allows the um, application context to talk, communicate safely with the network without using the operating system. And a big feature of this architecture is it, is it reduces the overhead required to invoke the network stack. So you can reduce, reduce overhead significantly by not going to the operating system. And, and under some circumstances, you can, um, you can actually run with much, a much reduced rate of interrupts as well. Now, it, it actually turns out, and Dave's going to go into this in a lot, more, a lot more detail later on. I'm really just introducing this. But it, it does turn out that some models of computation just lend themselves much more naturally to this kind of architecture. And the, the classic, the uh, you know, multiple processes with message passing that's used in the high performance commu compute community with, H with um, MPI and all the, all the high performance compute codes that over MPI do fit this architecture very well. Um, whereas the kind of classic, the more commonly used um, threads with uh, shared memory type model of computation has a lot of difficulty with this sort of architecture. And we're going to go into this in, in a lot more detail through the talk. Um, so if you, you know, it's, it's not just the computational model of the application for, you know, if you're trying to apply that kind of architecture out of the box of, 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 of um, 
applications which are able to use middleware provided for them. Um, if you're trying to run with a, what I say, bleeding edge network architecture for a standard or a, or a classic or an everyday application, you also run into the issue that these applications are written with, with particular APIs. And they're written to support semantics of particular APIs, uh, for example, POSIX. Um, and again, David's going to go through a lot of these examples um, in, in, a, in a lot more detail. But um, just, just very simply, you know, if you do exec and you're a, you've got a load of network protocol state tied up in your application context, you've just lost all of that state. So how, does that, you know, how, how do you cope with that? And, and lots of the other issues. But generally, again, a common denominator of you know, what's the nub of the, of the difficulty in, in supporting an everyday application with a high performance network is the state which is required for, to perform network protocol processing and having that state living in the application's address space and the application's context. That's the problem of dealing with that state is one of the reasons, or it's one of the implicitly one of the reasons why a lot of high performance networks push that down into the network. So you see effectively transport processing being, being done on the network or a very strict model of network communication enforced on the application. So that's until now. With, with the open onloads project, the open onload architecture, we're trying to address um, how to cross over between those two parallel universes, how to achieve, how to apply a high performance compute network architecture to an everyday application that happens to be using the network. I'm going to go through some of the basic principles of the architecture and then we're going to go down a level and talk in a lot more detail about how, how they're implemented. So the first principle is that is, is, the, is actually the OS bypass property that I described earlier, that the, the network needs to provide a fully protected virtualized interface. So that means that um, you, know, you could have a whole load of applications. Each of those can have a, a hardware mapped network virtualized network adapter into its address space. It's safe for an application to transmit and receive packets. That means that an application can't DMA data into anybody else's address space. There needs to be a model of virtual memory, which the, the adapter is part of. It also means that um, the separation of those interfaces needs to be enforced by hardware so that you, you can't hog all the resources of a machine because these applications are, spaces are not necessarily trusted. Um, the second property is that protocol processing can take place both, or for, protocol processing for a given flow can take place both in the application context but also in the operating system context. And that's important where um, you know, where, where processing needs to take place on behalf of an application. If, for example, an application disappears, yet processing, processing needs, to, needs to occur. And then the third property is that both, if, if both the kernel and the user space are involved in protocol processing on behalf of an application, then they need to communicate through shared state. So it needs to be an efficient, because the whole point of this is to avoid overheads, it needs to be an efficient means of communicating that state back and forth between the user context and the kernel. And because the kernel's involved, that, that communications channel needs to be protected from malicious or buggy applications. So that's the open onload architecture quickly. And David here is going to go through um, a whole load of implementation details and how we, how we solve those specific problems to dealing with um, with state and so forth in the, uh, in the con application context. Okay, Great. Dave. Thanks very much, Steve. So the, the first thing when you're creating a high performance networking is what do you concentrate on? How do you improve performance? And the answer is overhead, CPU overhead. And that's almost always the answer. First of all, if you're spending time on the CPU doing stuff in the network, you're not spending that time in your real application. And that's where you want to be spending your time, right? Some applications, however, can't make progress because they're waiting for something to happen. So in, in that case, the latency of the network can have an effect. You're waiting for a message. The time that that message takes to get to you is determined by the latency. What is latency composed from? Well, it's composed of how long it takes the hardware to send your uh, message out onto the wire, 
how long it takes to cross the network, and how much time it spends being processed by the, the network protocol. Um, bandwidth is the, the number that most people think of when they think of performance. But actually, all bandwidth is is a thing that constrains latency when you've got large messages. If you've got high bandwidth, then your large messages will get there quickly. And what determines your bandwidth? Your link speed, obviously. Um, secondly, algorithms. If you've got any loss on TCP, your bandwidth will suffer horrendously. And the thing that will determine what bandwidth you get will be what are the algorithms that you have for, for recovering from loss and retransmitting and all that sort of stuff. The other thing is buffering. If you haven't got enough buffering to satisfy your bandwidth delay product, then you won't be able to saturate the link. Um, and finally, it's overhead. If you haven't got enough CPU grunt to actually push the packets onto the wire quickly enough or receive them quickly enough, that will limit your bandwidth. So overhead is, is, the, is the thing that we can improve because the link speed is fixed. The algorithms for TCP basically have been specified in the RFCs. There's a little bit of cleverness you can do, but basically you have to follow the rules. And the buffering, that's up to the administrator really to, to make sure there's enough of it. And finally, there's the scalability. So you've got your server with lots and lots of cores. Um, everyone knows that most applications don't scale linearly with a number of cores. You get uh, crosstalk between the cores and all sorts of stuff. And that's an area where the architecture of, of your network stack and all the software that goes with it can have a big effect on your performance. Um, but really, all of those crosstalk effects have the effect what they're doing is in increasing the software overhead. So overhead is the key. And that's pretty much what I'm going to be talking about for most of the talk. So here is um, what traditional standard kernel networking looks like. What I've done is I've got a gray box on the right-hand side. And you'll see this in most of my diagrams. And that is stuff that's going on in the OS kernel. On the left-hand side, you've got stuff that's happening in user space. And the box is an application. Well, actually, it's really a process. This bit of the box here that overlaps the kernel is the bit of kernel state um, that's associated with that process. And here you've got a file descriptor table. So at user level, you reference files and sockets with an integer. And this table just converts that integer into some bit of data structure that implements your file or your socket. Um, here you've got your application logic. And applications talk to the kernel through the system C library, which is just a dynamically loaded shared library, which then invokes system calls. And the interface that we're most concerned with is the BSD sockets interface, because that's what everybody uses, uh, possibly WinSock if you're on Windows. And aspects of the system call interface that, that have an effect on user processes that we'll come to shortly. So the other parts of the system, of course, are the stack, which runs entirely in the kernel, the socket, and the network interface controller or network adapter. Um, all of this is generic, and your network adapter will come with a driver, and that driver is the thing basically that pushes packets onto and off the network. So here is a sort of classic, simple approach to doing user level networking. Essentially, you stick your stack at user level. As Steve described, you want to bypass the OS, and you've got to get network packets in and out of your user process. So you've got to have a direct connection to your adapter. And this is your virtualized interface. VNIC stands for virtual NIC. You've got to intercept the uh, sockets, BSD sockets API that the application is invoking. And you've got to get there before libc does. And fortunately, on Unix operating systems, there's a, there's a system called LD Preload that basically it says, please load my shared library ahead of anybody else's shared library. And please consider my symbols that I export to be the ones that are, are dominant. So all we've got here is a, is a library which exports up this edge, um, read, write, send, receive, listen, accept, all the standard system calls, um, and uh, implements them for the user level stack. Of course, we have to cope with uh, kernel files and sockets as well. So we have a file descriptor table here. And, and it, we've got one user level socket in this case. And anything that isn't present in this table, we assume that it's uh, a kernel implemented uh, file or socket, in which case the system call just gets passed through into libc and then up to the kernel. 
And in this case, I've just illustrated a, a file as well as our socket. So how do we do the, the safe user level access to the network? So this is a smart NIC. It's a standard NIC won't be able to do this without modification. Here's the bit called the VNIC. And essentially, it's uh, a, a receive interface, a transmit interface, and a way of notifying the application of what's going on. So secondly, of course, not all packets are going to want to go to user level. So we have to have some means of deep multiplexing received packets and sending them to the right place. And that's what I've got over on this side, which we call the filter table in our implementation. So packets come in. We extract fields from the header, compare them with entries in this, and that identifies a particular vNIC. The NIC will support lots of vNICs so that you can support lots of applications. And of course, you'll have some special vNICs which are just used by the kernel for, for standard networking. So packets come in, filter table sends them to a vNIC, and then we look in a descriptor ring. So this ring contains the addresses of buffers that receive packets should be placed in. Because we have to protect the system from badly behaved applications, the addresses in here won't be physical addresses, they'll be virtualized addresses. And those addresses are looked up in this table, which is essentially a special sort of page table. And that resolves the address to a real buffer in the application's address space. When the packet arrives, we then send a notification into a notification queue. So this is how the application determines what's happened. Um, transmits, just the reverse. These are the, the addresses of packets in memory that we, that we want to send. And the final thing is we have to have some doorbells. And these are just means of telling the hardware when we've put new descriptors into the RX and TX rings. OK, Steve mentioned earlier that there are some difficulties with user level networking. And they all arise from the fact that the OS has no idea what we're playing at. And we're trying to hide it from them. First one, as Steve mentioned, is exec. What happens when you do exec? Bang, everything disappears. And in the kernel, that's just fine because you've still got your kernel portion of the process state referencing the socket and the file. And when a new uh, application gets loaded, it's able to use those, assuming it knows what file descriptors to use, it can just go ahead and use them and everything's fine. Back to our user level stack. Bang, everything's gone. Application comes back. We'll assume for the moment that it loads the same user level library We'll assume that it can set up its connection to the vNIC again, but it's forgotten all about the socket. It's forgotten all of its protocol state, and there's no way to, to save you from that. Another interesting one is fork. So fork basically uh, makes two copies of your process. Everything at user level is duplicated. Everything in the kernel is duplicated, but you don't have two sockets and two files, you just have two references to those sockets and files. So in other words, these guys, if they want to, they can share those sockets and files. So they can both use them at the same time. They might not want to, in which case one of them might close them. But the point is we have to support that behavior because some applications do. Here's what happens when you fork with our, our trivial user level implementation. The kernel file's OK, but now we've got two copies of the socket, two copies of the protocol state. It's not really obvious what happens to this direct connection to the vNIC. Probably it will point to the same place if you've got a shared mapping. And now you've got two people trying to use the same bit of hardware, and they're not coordinating with each other. So clearly, that's not going to work. And there's a whole bunch of other problems. You can pass any file descriptor, including sockets, through a Unix domain socket to another process. Um, what happens, essentially, is, is the, the OS understands that this is happening, and it just creates a new file descriptor, a new reference to your so socket or file in the new process, invents a new file descriptor to, for that, and tells the process what it is. Um, and uh, clearly, in the user level model, that's not going to work very well, because the new process might not even have loaded the, the, the relevant library. And it certainly won't have the protocol state associated with your socket. And what's more, this, the, the kernel just won't do it. It'll say, I don't know anything about this file descriptor. I've never heard of it. Fail. Process exits, um, that's not just the end of your networking. If you've sent data on a TCP socket and then exit your process, 
it's a bit like doing shutdown. That data will still get to the receiver. Actually, there are some exceptions, but basically, you've got to keep doing protocol until the sockets close gracefully. And finally, processes aren't always continually invoking the, the network. But even when they don't, you've still got to make progress. Now, one solution to this that some people have looked at is, is using things like signals or extra threads to make progress when the real application isn't doing anything networking related. But the problem with that is that you're really changing the environment that the process is, is running in, and it's very difficult to hide that from the process, especially if you use things like signals because you've now taken a resource that the process thought it owned. So here are the requirements for our user level architecture. First of all, the state is going to have to live outside the process because it has to survive when the process exits and, uh, and also to survive exec when the user level state disappears. Um, we have to represent sockets in the FD table. That's because we've got to be able to pass them through the Unix domain sockets. And also because the kernel really has to know what file descriptors the process is using because otherwise it will reuse them and you'll get clashes. And finally, the state's got to be shareable between processes in order to support stuff like fork and passing sockets through domain sockets. So here's our solution. Here's the architecture. Essentially, our so-called user-level stack is created and basically lives in the kernel. It's divided into two bits. We've got a, a trusted bit, which is only visible to the kernel. And we've got the shared bit. And this is the bit that user-level processes will have direct access to. Here's our application. Here's our, our preload library. And what we've got here is a mapping onto this bit of shared state. As you can see, a socket here is represented in the kernel's uh, FD table. There's a bit of kernel-only state here. And this is essentially um, a standard kernel data structure that implements the, the file interface. But it's got a reference to our, our user-level socket. And the user level FD table, of course, also knows about our user level socket. And this is the place where we do the intercept so that we can do stuff at user level if we want to. So how does this architecture solve the problems that we talked about before? So here's what happens if we do a fork. Essentially, it just works. What we've done is we've mapped this shared state in as map shared. And what that means is when you fork, instead of getting a copy on write copy of the state, you actually get a shared copy of the state. And the other bit, the kernel bit, of course, just works because that's what the kernel already did. And exec, exec exec's a little bit more interesting. So first of all, everything gets blown away when you do exec. Fortunately, the stack's still there in the kernel, and we've still got our reference to the socket in the process's FD table process comes back, we're going to assume in this example that, um, that it's still using the user level library, the preload library. And now it's going to come in and try and use this socket. And at the moment, it doesn't really have a clue how that socket's implemented or even whether it's a socket at all. So the first thing it's going to do is invoke stat. And that, the operating system will tell us a little bit, a bit about the file descriptor that is implementing um, this particular file descriptor. And uh, the stat will come back and say, it's not a socket, it's not a file, it's uh, an onload thing. And uh, what we'll then do is we'll say, OK, we need to map in the, the, uh, the state of the stack into our user level address space. We can do that because we've got a file descriptor, and we just invoke mmap on that file descriptor with the appropriate arguments. And then finally, set up the, uh, the pointer in the FD table. The question is, of course, how do we deal with these, socket, with these sockets and files that aren't implemented at user level? And the answer is, the same thing will happen. You'll do stat, and we'll determine that actually this is just uh, something else that isn't a user level socket. And we put a special entry in the table that says, don't ever bother statting this one again. Just pass it straight through to the OS. So that's exec and fork. Passing file descriptors uh, through domain sockets and, and similar. Uh, and surviving process exit, hopefully, is obvious. Process goes away, this bit doesn't, until all the sockets have reached the closed state. So what's in that shared state? The answer is absolutely everything that you could possibly want in order to do anything performance critical at user level. So that includes sockets, the buffers that are going to contain the packets for transmission and the received packets, 
It's going to include the, the state that we need to manage the interface to the hardware. It's going to include the DMUX table. So this is when we receive a packet, we have to take the headers and resolve that to the actual socket state. Um, timers, so TCP protocol requires retransmit timers, zero window probes, all sorts of timers. Um, keeping track of free resources, some statistics, and some configuration. So um, what we've got now is some state, uh, which is moderately complex. It contains a whole bunch of data structures. Um, and it's going to be living in the kernel and multiple processes, potentially. And there's absolutely nothing to make you believe that their address spaces are in any way common. And there's absolutely no way that we can arrange that this shared state is mapped into the same address range in all these places. Therefore, it cannot contain any pointers at all. Everything in the shared state is indirected. In some cases, it's indirected at a fairly high level. So we have indexes that say, this socket index number three. Um, and you find it just by a, a simple indirection from a, the base of a, a memory map. Uh, in other cases, for more complex things like linked lists and stuff, that would become really painful. And so in those cases, we just encode pointers as offsets relative to some well-known pointer. And of course, each of the address spaces that, uh, that has the shared state will have a variety of pointers into the bits of the shared state that are mapped separately. Now, the problem, of course, is that we've got this state, and it's, it's touched by the kernel uh, in fairly complicated ways, and it's touched by the user level process in complicated ways. And uh, not all processes are trusted. In fact, generally speaking, none of them are. And you, you don't want anything that an application can do to compromise system integrity in any way at all. So this has two implications. First of all, it does change the trust model of the system slightly. First of all, applications that share shared state, if they're both mapping that shared state, they have to trust each other. Um, the reason for that is that the cost of validating everything is, A, it's going to increase overhead. And secondly, there's really no point, because if you don't trust this guy and he can smash up your stack, whichever way you look at it, he's going to be able to damage behavior. Secondly, we have a workaround for it, which we'll come to. But the thing that really matters is the kernel. And I'll come to how we protect the kernel in just a moment. First of all, how do we deal with the fact that we might not want to trust every process that we pass a socket to? So here's a classic example. You've got a server, let's say a web server. It receives connections from clients, and then it wants those connections to be implemented in some untrusted process. So perhaps your web server runs as root, but you want to run a CGI script as some unprivileged user. First thing is, you'll accept a new connection, and then you'll fork. So this is exactly the same thing that we saw earlier. And then you'll exec. So that guy will disappear. And then this time, when we load him, we don't allow him to map the, the state back in. So this will be a configuration option for the stack. Because we don't trust this guy, we're not going to share the state with him. His only route into this socket is through the syscall API. Now, you might worry that this is going to cost you some performance. But generally speaking, handlers for connections aren't all that long-lived. So they're not likely to be doing a huge amount through this interface. You're going to get some of the performance benefit of onload anyway, just by virtue of the fact that you're using the onload stack. And the third thing is that mapping that state into user level has a cost. And it's not trivial. Memory mapping isn't incredibly cheap. So if you've got a short-lived process, it's actually better that it doesn't map the state down to user level anyway. And the reason this works is because hanging off here is enough hooks that we can just implement the syscall API at the kernel level. So we have no problem at getting at this state and just doing exactly the same things in the kernel that we would have otherwise done at user level. Now, the key one is protecting the kernel. How do we make sure that when the kernel goes through all this potentially arbitrarily corrupted state that it doesn't panic itself? So we've got the trusted state that we saw here. And this contains all the pointers that we need into basically base regions of the shared state. It also contains any data structures that are sort of part of the kernel. And it also contains pointers to any resources that we need. So there's no way that the user level can overwrite something that will cause us to leak resources. All those resources are always hung off trusted state. 
The next thing we've got to do is make sure that we don't cause the kernel to fault. And basically what that comes down to is any time that you compute a pointer using state from the shared state, you have to validate that and make sure that it is not going to generate an address that's outside of the shared state. And essentially there are two ways of doing it. One of them is by explicit checking. The other one is essentially by applying masks to offsets to give you a pointer that's guaranteed to be within a certain distance of the beginning of, the, of, well, you've got a guarantee that if your pointer is here and it's a data structure of size x, pointer plus x doesn't take you outside of the shared state. And that can be done very cheaply. Finally, we're following things like linked lists. And it's obviously trivially easy to set up a linked list that's a circle. And so if your algorithm just follows the linked list until it gets to the end, then it's very easy to see how you could put the kernel into a tight loop. And the way that we solve that is simply by any loop that the kernel can execute is bounded with a counter. And the maximum bound of that loop comes from some trusted state. So you can probably make the kernel work a bit harder than it otherwise would have done, but you can't actually lock it up completely. Another thing that's in the shared state but is a little bit special is the control plane. So this is uh, the ARP table. The ARP table is the thing that says, given an IP address, what's the MAC address? And the root table, which is the thing that says, given an IP address, which interface am I going out of? And the interface table, which just gives you a bit of information about the, the network ports. There's just one copy of that. And it's shared by all of the user level stacks, of which there are potentially many. And it's, shared, and it's mapped read only. So no untrusted code can corrupt it. So it's always guaranteed to have the right stuff in it. Entries inside that table are protected with generation counters. And so there's a, a bit of protocol that says how you have to read it to make sure that whatever you read is fully valid. Um, and to make it really cheap, anything that is always talking to the same person, so any sort of connected socket, whether it's TCP or UDP, keeps a cache of their layer two information, keeps a cache of the headers, and, all they've, and also the position of the entry in the table that they're using. And all they've got to do to check that their information is still valid is just check that the generation counter hasn't changed. So that's really, really cheap. And it doesn't even involve any bus locked or atomic operations, which is very important. If we do make changes to the table, such as, well, let's say we make changes to the root table, that could actually have a knock-on effect on any number of TCP sockets. But we don't want the TCP sockets to have to check the root table every time they send a packet. So what we do is, if we change the root table, any possible entry in the ARP table that might have been affected by that root change, they all get their generation counters bumped. And that forces the, the sender to go onto a slow path, makes him have a look at the whole of the routing process from scratch, and get new information if necessary. And of course, this information has to be kept up to date because things can change on the fly. So we synchronize it with the Linux control plane using Netlink sockets. So um, we've got a parallel stack. There are two stacks going on here. There's still a kernel stack, of course. And potentially, there are other adapters that aren't onload enabled. There's more than one route out of this box. And of course, you've got the loopback interface. You've got to be able to talk to applications on the same box. Um, when you open a socket, you've got no idea where it's going to go until they connect or bind. In fact, if it's a UDP socket, they may never connect it, in which case, at any point, it can receive packets from anywhere and send packets to anywhere. Um, when you do come to connect something, well, initially, you're going to have to have made it as a user level socket. And, but you might dis discover that actually it's going to go out on the loopback interface, or perhaps it's going to go out on another interface, in which case, you've got to have a kernel socket. Listening sockets are a bit like UDP sockets in that they've got to be able to accept stuff from anywhere, from local loopback, from other interfaces, the whole shebang. A UDP I've already mentioned. The only way that we can support that is with a kernel socket. So this is the diagram you've seen before. All we do is we add a kernel socket there. That means that when we come to accept new connections from a user level listening socket, we have to check the user level state and say, are there any new connections ready to be accepted at user level? And we also have to have a look at the kernel socket and say, is there anything there? But of course, we only have to look at the kernel socket if there's nothing available in the user level socket. So in other words, we only take the hit of going into the kernel if nothing's happening at user level. 
In the case that you've got uh, an active open connection, say a TCP connection, and you discover after you've done all this work and created this that actually the connection is going to go out over the kernel socket, we can cut the user level stack completely out of the way just by doing that. We basically take the kernel socket, put it straight into the FD table where the user level socket was, mark it as a pass-through socket. We might have to keep the user level state around because it's possible that that socket is known about in another process as well. And that process won't have seen this change to the FD table. But if we know that that socket's only referenced in this application, then we can get rid of the user level state as well, and it all gets cleaned up. OK, so moving on, how do we actually process network events? Sure. A common right, yeah. So the question is, essentially, do the two stacks have a single address space for network endpoints? And in particular, let's say port space for TCP sockets. Um, and the answer is yes. So because for, for every active open connection that we create, for every unique port that we use, we have a kernel socket. And any time that we assign a port, we actually bind the kernel socket. And only when we've bound the kernel socket do we know that we've got that port. Now, it sounds a little bit like we're burning a lot of resource here. It's not quite as bad as it sounds. Um, we only need to create this socket for active open connections and listening connections. Every connection that is created by accepting a new connection at user level from a user level listening socket, it's going to have the same port number as the listening socket. And therefore, we've already reserved that port. There's no conflict. So handling network events. The way this works in a traditional kernel stack is packets arrive. They get delivered to memory by DMA. Notifications go into the notification queue that I showed you earlier. And an interrupt gets raised. The, uh, the vendor of the hardware handles that interrupt, uh, talks to the hardware, creates some packet data structures that the kernel understands, passes them into the kernel stack. Eventually, perhaps if you've got some payload in those packets, it'll get queued in the socket. At some indeterminate time, possibly later, the application will invoke the, the OS, do a receive, and say, give me that data. Or possibly the application already did that, and maybe it's blocking waiting for the data, in which case you have to wake it up, and then it can, can pull the data. We do things a little bit differently. First of all, by default, no interrupts. Reason is we're trying to get absolutely minimum overhead, and interrupts cost you quite a lot. So what's going to happen is those notifications are going to go into your notification queue just as they do with the kernel stack, except no one's going to look at them until the application says, I need that data. So when the application invokes receive, goes into our user level receive code, we have a look in the receive queue of the socket. If there's any data there, we just return it. If there isn't any data there, then we'll invoke Stackpole. And Stackpole will look at the notification queue, see which packets have been received, pass them through the protocol. Potentially, they'll end up in the socket. If they do, data gets returned to the application. Similarly, in send, the only reason that we'd invoke Stackpole is because we think it might possibly cause some progress to be made. If we can make progress without calling stack poll, we will. And also, poll and select, so these are the things that allow you to find out which of a large number of file descriptors are ready for I.O. The problem is with these, they look at lots and lots of sockets, potentially, and you don't want to be calling stack poll each time you look at a socket. So we arrange that with these guys, we call stack poll once when you first do it on a socket in a particular stack. But any other sockets in the stack won't get stack poll called. If a thread uh, blocks on a socket, then somebody has got to wake that thread up when something happens. And in that case, we do enable interrupts. Doesn't hurt performance particularly, though, because there's a good chance if a thread's blocking, then maybe the system isn't as busy as it otherwise would be. And besides, you've got no choice. The interrupt basically behaves exactly like it does in traditional architecture, which is to say it causes us to look at the notification queue and handle the protocol. The only difference is, because it's an interrupt, we're doing it in the kernel instead of at user level. So what exactly does Stackpole do? 
We'll come to this one in a sec. Looks at the notification queue, uh, which is this is the point at which it handles all received packets and, and determines which packets have been sent. Refills the RX ring, so this means give the hardware more buffers to deliver into. Refill the TX ring, in other words, make sure the hardware stays busy so that you saturate the link. And process timers, so this is the bit where we say, did our transmit uh, time out, in which case do we need to retransmit it? So the behavior that I just described, where we only process the stack when we need to, has some consequences. First of all, it can mean that you get more batching. There's a reasonable chance that if you haven't called stack poll for a while, when you do call it, there'll be lots to do. And generally speaking, if you have lots to do, you can do it very efficiently compared with if you do things piecemeal. So that allows us to reduce overheads a bit. On the other hand, this one kind of, these, these two don't both happen. You get one or the other, really. Uh, the more responsive, what this is, is that if you go, um, if you call receive and the data is ready, you'll get it straight away. That isn't always true with the kernel stack. It's very common to have your interrupt rate moderated. So what you do there is you say, I don't want to get interrupts at an arbitrary rate because they can overwhelm the system. So we'll say we only want an interrupt every 60 microseconds at most. And that means if you call receive at the beginning of that period, you might have to wait anything up to 60 microseconds before you realize that your data's there. That model, this model doesn't suffer from that, that uh, pause, although it will suffer from that pause if it has blocked and gone into interrupt mode. But the big one, the really key thing, is this improved temporal and spatial cache locality. When the kernel processes network events, it does so because the data has just arrived in memory. It doesn't do so because the application is about to use that data. And there might be a big gap, both in terms of time and space. So first of all, in terms of time, because you can process the received data, and it can sit there in a socket for arbitrary amounts of time before the application actually wants it. And in space, because the interrupt might happen on one CPU, but your application will be potentially on a different CPU. In which case, you've bought all of the protocol and socket state into one cache, and then when the application receives the data, some of that state, at least, will have to move into a different cache. Another problem we talked about earlier was what happens if the application isn't processing the network. And in particular, with our incredibly lazy model, where we don't bother to even look at the network until the application asks us to, if an application's away doing something else, then potentially uh, things are going to go wrong. In particular, if packets keep coming in and we're not refilling that descriptor ring, eventually they're going to get dropped on the floor. The TX ring's going to go empty, and your, your link's going to go idle. And, uh, if you're not processing your timers, then uh, you're not going to comply with the TCP protocol. And finally, if you don't respond to receive packets promptly, so for example, if you receive data on the TCP, you've got to hack it within a certain time frame. If you don't, the other guy might retransmit it. And if he does that, all hell breaks loose. Performance will dive. And our solution to that is that we've got a kind of like a watchdog timer on the, lit, on the, on the network adapter. And this thing is running all the time. And when we call stack poll, occasionally we'll reset it and say start again at 500 microseconds or whatever. If that thing ever hits zero, it raises an interrupt, and that forces us to, to call stack poll, and that's how we make progress. OK, so a big deal for us is concurrency control. Um, concurrency control is, is an area where you can really easily throw away all of your performance. And it's also a place that's really tricky for a user-level stack, particularly if you're sharing state between user-level and the kernel. In particular, you can't just use simple locks. Let's say uh, I grab a lock at user-level, and then we want to have a go um, at accessing that state in the kernel, perhaps from an ISR. You can't ask the kernel to block on a lock, which is held by user-level. User-level might never drop that lock. User-level might be stopped, <coughs> might not even uh, might not be scheduled for a very long time. So first of all, there are correctness problems that we have to deal with. And secondly, concurrency control is always expensive. Locks are expensive. Um, contention at user level is particularly expensive, because when you get contention with, with traditional locks, you put yourself to sleep. And waking up costs you something. Um, the kernel doesn't have such a bad problem, because 
state in the kernel stack is generally speaking protected either by clever tricks like uh, RCU or alternatively using spin locks. And the kernel can be absolutely certain that whoever's got a spin lock will let go of it pretty soon. And so if you spend some time spinning, it's not going to cost you that big a deal. And it's almost certainly going to be cheaper than blocking. But we can't use spin locks because, as I say, first of all, the person holding the lock might not release it soon. He might be descheduled. And secondly, the kernel and user level can't contend with each other. So we've got a classic trade-off. Um, we want to minimize our locking overhead. And that means we don't want to be taking and releasing lots of locks. That means we only want one lock, really, because um, that's, that's clearly the minimum. Problem is, one lock's not going to work very well because everyone's going to contend with each other, especially when you've got lots of threads on lots of cores. Therefore, we've got to have fine-grained locking, right? Well, it's not quite that simple because there are some clever tricks that, that uh, the academics have come up with. They've got all these lock-free algorithms that uh, essentially use atomic operations, atomic memory operations that allow you to do stuff to memory atomically, compare and swap, atomic increments, a uh, variety of other things. And these allow you to construct data structures that, that you can manipulate without holding any sorts of lock. And it's guaranteed that everyone will make progress. The problem is all of these algorithms depend on bus locked atomic operations. And these are expensive, <coughs> literally hundreds of cycles each time you invoke one, even if there's no clash between you and somebody else accessing that memory location. And that's the sort of place where overhead will just eat you up. So how do we deal with this conundrum? Well, first of all, anything that we do a lot of, it had better not involve atomic operations, and it better not involve taking a lock each time we do it. So we do have one big lock, which covers everything that you could possibly want to do in Stackpole. And Stackpole will almost never have to do any more locking or any atomic operations. Things that applications do, we try to avoid them touching that lock. So stack poll is all about processing received packets and putting them in places and sending packets in response. Applications are typically about receiving data, changing configuration, and sending data. And the main overlap there is the sending data one, because clearly sending is going to have to coordinate with what's going in on in Stackpole. And we'll talk about how we solve that in a moment. The other thing we do is we try and minimize locking. So we try and make sure that for anything that we want to do, we don't have to take more than one lock in the stack. And finally, we want to avoid those bus locked operations if we can, although they do come in handy occasionally. So we will use them if we have no choice because we want to avoid contention. But in the cases that we can do stuff uncontended, then we'll try and avoid the bus locked operations. So in other words, we want the best of both worlds. Here's the model. First of all, big lock covers a whole variety of stuff. It covers lots of the protocol stuff. It, can, it covers parts of what's in your sockets, particularly stuff on the transmit path and some of the receive path. It covers completely the VNIC interface, where you talk to the hardware. Um, then you've got the socket lock, one per socket, and that protects mostly the receive path and little bits of the transmit path. And finally, we've got a lock over here, which is protecting this FD table. Actually, this isn't as simple as a lock. Again, if we just had a lock there, it would cause horrific contention problems with multiple threads accessing this table. So it's actually a lot cleverer than that, but I don't have time to go into the details. Instead, we'll talk about the receive path. So first of all, every socket has a receive queue, which is where data goes uh, once it's been identified by stack pole, sent to a socket, gets plonked on a receive queue. And that's just a linked list. So we've got a head pointer and a tail pointer. If we receive another packet, it'll just get appended to the end of that list, and the tail pointer moves on. As I said, anything that happens in stack pole is protected by the stack lock. So that just happens. What happens when you want to take some data out of the receive queue? So the application comes along. First of all, we've got to serial, serialize multiple threads that are trying to receive data from the same socket. It doesn't happen much. Generally speaking, only one thread will be using a socket at a time. But it could happen. Therefore, we've got to protect. So that's where the socket lock comes in. And we've got an extract pointer. And it can be pointing at null, or it can be pointing into the queue. 
And essentially, it's pointing at the first packet that contains data that hasn't been consumed yet. And as we consume data, we just move that along. But we don't free up the buffers. And there are two reasons we don't free up the buffers. Is One is we can't free them up without touching this pointer here. And we can't touch that pointer because we don't own it when we're holding the socket lock. And secondly, if we did free them up, we'd have to free them up into a free pool. And that free pool would have to have some sort of synchronization mechanism. And that means either a lock or atomic operations. And we, we don't want to do that because that's expensive. So we just leave them there. We've consumed all the data now. And they stay there essentially until either we need some more memory and we'll go and look for it, or alternatively, next time some data arrives on this socket. So a new packet arrives, gets appended to the list, and we'll have a look at the head pointer and we'll say, while that pointer isn't the same as the extract pointer, free those packets up. Unfortunately, we can't free the last one because it would violate the protocol. There's, there's no way that you can get rid of the last buffer without holding the stack and the socket lock. Um, but we consider that to be a small price to pay. And if you really need that memory, you can. You can just, normally, if you're trying to free up memory, you'll be holding the stack lock. You'll come along, try and grab the socket lock using a try lock operation. If you can get it, then you can free that buffer up. If you can't, then you just say, hey, tough luck. We'll live without it. Transmit paths are a little bit more complex. First of all, again, we've got to serialize multiple threads talking to the same socket. So we do grab the socket lock. We grab some buffers. Here, we, we don't want to be contending the stack lock, but we do have to get some buffers from somewhere. So we have a shared pool of buffers on an atomic stack-based pool, essentially. So here we are using uh, a bus locked op operation in order to grab some buffers. We grab them. We fill them with data. We don't bother to initialize the headers particularly. We might initialize some of the headers, the bits that don't depend particularly on knowing what state the socket's in. But essentially, we leave those alone. So we just put the data in the buffers. Then, if we can get the stack log, we'll grab it. And we'll put the packets in the send queue. Assuming we've got some congestion window and some receive window available, we'll send a packet. And in this example, we haven't got enough window available to send both of them. So that one stays in the send queue. This one goes in the retransmit queue. So that's the queue where data lives until it's acknowledged by the receiver. In other words, we have to keep it until the receiver says, thanks, I got it. Now, that's the easy case. That's the case that we were able to get the stack lock without blocking. If we weren't, so now we've filled a couple more buffers. Instead, we check it on this thing called the pre-queue. This guy, atomic bus locked operation. So we, we can put stuff on here without holding the stack lock, um, and we can take stuff off concurrently. So adding buffers to that queue and taking buffers off that queue can be done concurrently. Now, the problem is we can't just leave them there. We have to get them into the send queue and potentially send them out on the wire. But on the other hand, we don't want to wait for the stack lock in order to do that, because that's going to kill us. We're going to have to block, and uh, uh, clearly, that's going to hurt performance. So instead, what we do is that we, we mark a, a bit in the stack lock that says, when you've finished what you're doing, please go and have a look at the sockets that are on the deferred queue. The socket is put into a linked list, which is also on an atomic uh, data structure, of sockets that contain work to do. And when the guy who's holding the stack lock tries to release it, he gets forced onto a slow path. And before he releases the lock, he'll take these buffers, remove them from the pre-queue, move them onto the send queue, and uh, have a look, see if he can send some more data. So the first buffer just got acknowledged. And maybe, maybe now, this time, we can send two more buffers. Job done. No contention. The only time that we will hit contention on the send path is if we uh, run out of buffers in the, uh, the, the pool of buffers that can be taken without holding the stack lock. And what we do is we try and make sure that that pool has about the right number of buffers in it. And the way that we do that is whenever we free up buffers that have been acknowledged, we don't return them to the sort of central pool. We return them to what we call the async pool, which is the pool where you can grab them without holding the stack lock. 
the really nice thing about this model is when we filled those buffers with data, that's a mem copy, that's the expensive bit. That takes all of the time on the transmit path. The rest of it is just pointers and, and a bit of protocol, which is really, really cheap by comparison. So the expensive bit isn't done while holding the stack lock. Only the cheap bits are, and therefore the amount of time spent holding that lock is small, which again helps us avoid contention. OK. So it's always nice to be able to see what's going on inside your network stack. And uh, that's a little bit trickier in the kernel than it is at user level. Obviously, one thing you can do is just attach your debugger, follow some pointers, and see what's going on. We've got another solution, though, which is called stack dump. And it's, it's, a, it's just a process, unprivileged, although you do have to run it as root. Essentially, it opens a special kind of file descriptor on our onload device and says, I would like to attach to this particular stack. And then does mmap and gets a copy of that stack down at user level. And now this guy can do anything he likes. He can inspect the stack. He can grab the lock in order to stop anything from happening so that he can fiddle around and see, see what state we're in. He can grab socket locks. He can mutate the state and uh, basically do anything. This is really useful for debugging, uh, really useful for profiling your applications. You can look at all your sockets, work out how, how much data is going through them, and see what bandwidth they're getting, and see if it's fairly shared between the sockets, all sorts of stuff. So here's an example output. Here's some information about a particular stack, information about the, the lock. It's not locked at the moment, and there's no deferred work waiting. Well, in fact, there couldn't be, because if it's unlocked, there can't be deferred work. Um, Interrupts are not enabled. Here's some information about how many socket buffers it's, are in use, 12 sockets at the moment. Here's some information about the packet buffers that have been allocated. Um, here's, basically, this is information about the, the hardware interface, the transmit descriptor ring, the receive descriptor ring. Looks like we've got 13 transmits in progress at the moment. And here's some information about time. This track, the stack clearly has to keep track of time so that it can keep track of timers. This is saying that the last time the stack was, actually, I'm not sure what that one is. My apologies. This one says, last time we were polled was at this time. This one says what the time is now. And that just says that's how long ago it was that the stack was last polled. And here's an example output for a socket. So your, your four tuple of IP addresses and port numbers, it's in the established state, uh, not currently locked. This is state that, that uh, relates to how we support locking and waking up processes. Here's some socket flags. It's got the, the non-blocking flag. It's got uh, TCP no delay enabled. It's got a filter. So that means it's got an entry in the hardware filter table. So, a listening socket or a, an active open socket would have a filter. A passive open socket wouldn't have a filter because it would just share the filter that the listening socket is using. Um, here's just some generic uh, socket information. Here's all the send state, sequence numbers, windows, congestion management. No congestion at the moment. We're open. Here's the receive state. Again, sequence numbers, fast path that is enabled. FastPath basically allows you to avoid some of the checks that you would otherwise have to do. Uh, whenever you have any sort of out-of-order data or anything, or uh, any congestion, you get pushed off the FastPath. Here's the state of the receive queue. 11 packets are in the receive queue at the moment. This means there are that many bytes of data in the receive queue, no out-of-order data, and information about the windows bit more information about MSSs and user IDs and all sorts of stuff. And here are the timers associated with this socket. We've got some data in flight. So that's data that we've sent, but that hasn't been acknowledged yet. And so we have to have an RTO timer running. So this is a timer that will fire if we need to retransmit data. And we've also exhausted the, the window that was advertised by the other end. So we're running a Zwin timer. And the point of that is, um, we'll have another go at sending a small amount of data. We'll just send a probe if this timer expires, and that protects you from acts getting lost. OK, so finally, what does all this add up to? Does it help performance? I probably wouldn't be here if it didn't help at all. 
So our test platform is, is just a really standard server, um, possibly even a slightly underpowered one by today's uh, standards. It's got a single quad-core Xeon processor, not horribly fast, um, reasonable amount of RAM, standard Intel chipset. It's got one of our SolarStorm NICs in it, CX4, so that means it's not actually running over the 10 gig base T, it's just got a very simple FI in this example. Back to back, so we've got no switch, um, and we're running standard Red Hat Enterprise. So first of all, latency. Simple ting ping pong, so that just means two applications on different nodes, this guy sends the other guy a message, he sends it back, how long did that take? Divide that by two, that's your half round trip latency. Now, first of all, using that VNIC uh, interface that you saw, I can actually construct a very, very simple user-level process that doesn't do any protocol at all. So it doesn't use onload. All it does is construct a packet in advance, in a buffer, and then say, send that packet to the other guy, and the other guy will send it back again. No protocol at all. All it is is pinging the pack packet backwards and forwards. So in other words, there's no overhead from intercept, there's no protocol, there's no locking, there's no nothing. So this is measuring the hardware performance, both the PCIe bus and also our NIC and the, the PHY and the time it takes to cross the link. And that takes 4.2 microseconds. Question. Sure. Is that, is that for a single packet or are you running thousands of packets on the averaging? Yeah. So the question was, was that a single packet or thousands of packets and averaging? And the answer is, is a million round trips and we're taking the average. Here's what the kernel does in this particular configuration, 11.2 microseconds, and here's what onload's getting. Now, it looks like we've halved the latency, and we have. The important question is, how much of the overhead have we taken out? So this number is simply that number minus the hardware component. And so this is telling you that a single send plus a single receive is costing you seven microseconds of CPU time with the kernel stack, and it's costing you 1.1 microseconds of CPU time with onload. As I said, bandwidth basically comes down to your overhead, assuming that you're not uh, limited, well, depending on whether you're link limited or not. Here's what happens when we compare onload with the kernel. First of all, both of them can saturate the link and uh, for TCP, when you take into account protocol headers, that's 9.4 gigabits. The interesting space is this space. So what we're seeing here is, because we've got reduced per packet overheads and reduced per message overheads, we can saturate the link a lot earlier. And for your small message sizes, we can pretty much double your throughput. But onload is running on just one CPU here, not because we've said only run on one CPU, but because we're only doing the polling of the stack in response to the application requests. Because it's a single-threaded application, it will naturally only consume one CPU core while it's doing this benchmark. The kernel, however, was configured for this test to run on two CPUs. The application is uh, bound to one core, and the interrupt that the, the hardware generates is bound to another core. The two cores are sharing a level two cache, and that turns out to be the best configuration for performance. And what it means is that this guy to get this performance is using rather more CPU than this guy. And here's what happens if you bind the interrupt and the application to the same core. So this is really, I think this is the fair comparison. Here's the performance that you get when you've only got one core available to you. And finally, I've added another one into the mix. What you've got here is the onload stack, but without a user level intercept. So if you remember, we had the case of an untrusted child where we, we forked off, we did an exec, but we didn't allow them to map the stack into user level. And that means they still have to access the stack through the, the kernel interface. In that case, you lose some of the per message benefits. It becomes a bit more expensive for each message that you send. But the per packet overheads and all the other overheads that we've cut out, you still get that benefit which means when you get to the larger message sizes, you basically get the same performance. So here's a bit of UDP performance. Um, sorry, just stick with that one. Um, so one sender, single socket, 
uh, kernel's getting best part of half a million messages per second, which is pretty good. That's only a couple of microseconds per message. On load, doing four times the rate. Again, what I've done here with the kernel is I've said, run on as many CPUs as you like, which means in practice it's going to be using one and a bit cores for this particular test. If you have two senders, so this is two completely independent processes, you're going to get a bit more from the kernel, but at some point you're going to get a bottleneck. And that's because you're not able to spread the load nearly as well over the available cores. On load, however, in this example, you've not quite got double, but you're not far off it. You're not actually going to go any higher than that, unfortunately, because you've now hit a hardware limit. Our NIC won't do more than 4 million messages per second. But the point is, on load is scaling nicely when you add more work. Yes? So I lost track. Which kernel are you using? Which version of the kernel? This is a 2618-8 standard Red Hat Enterprise 5 kernel. So it's not quite the bleeding edge. But what, what we've noticed, and, uh, and I think other people have noticed too, is that they did a lot of good work in terms of performance between the early 2.6 kernels and around the 2.6.16 time. And since then, not much has changed. Um, so performance hasn't changed that much. I think you'd see similar sort of performance with the latest stuff. Yes? So you're using a different driver, right? Yes. Because so I look at the unload graph and the AES unload, so it's going to the kernel. Mm -hmm. That's what I would expect to what you're going to the kernel, right? So that difference, if you go to the previous slide, that difference between the, uh, the red and the green, yeah. it's what I would expect if I use only the kernel, but I use right. the change so, that you have made. So this is, this is the kernel doing the best that it can, but using more than one core. Yeah? This is what happens if you only allow the kernel to have one core. And so now I'm saying, like for like, kernel on one core, on load in the kernel with one core, and on load at user level with one core. But wouldn't I expect if I optimize the kernel with the change you made, Low, right. Would okay. Expect a green one for the kernel version. Yes. So, if it, if you took the sorts of techniques that, that we've taken and applied them to the kernel stack to reduce overhead, you could hit this line. Because Absolutely. On kernel, not in user space, just by optimizing it the way you optimize. Absolutely. For your own so, the the user level part of the of the equation it buys you this gap here. Yeah. So in particular, if your application sends massive messages, you probably don't need the user level aspect of it. But if you want the absolute best latency, and you want decent performance with small and medium sized messages, then user level buys you something. But user level is only part of what we've done, as you can see. OK, so that's UDP transmit. Here's UDP receive performance. Uh, I'm showing three things here. This is the kernel forced to use only one core. This is the kernel when it's allowed to use two cores, and this is on load. Again, it's naturally just using one core in this example. I, the only reason that this doesn't go down to zero is because I got bored. But what's happening here is, on the x-axis, I'm increasing the load. So we've got a transmitter that's sending at anywhere between 500 and 3 million packets per second, so 500,000 and 3 million packets per second. And we're measuring how many the application receives. There comes a point when the system gets overwhelmed and you start throwing stuff away. The kernel reaches that point a little under 600,000. And what happens then is as your offered load increases, you spend more and more time in your interrupt handler processing received packets, less and less time in your application, so therefore, you receive less and less packets, and eventually performance bottoms out. And that's a problem that's called uh, receive live lock that was uh, covered in the literature years ago. And that was a really, really big problem until we came across multi-core machines. And then, of course, now, actually, this is the behavior that you get, which is that interrupts will happen on one CPU, probably saturate that CPU completely, but at least your application will be able to still run on another core and make some decent progress. So, Really, this is two cores with the kernel. This is on load using just one core. And as you can see, it's uh, getting rather more packets per second through. Another question. Yeah. So I'm curious, 
one second, but currently on load on the AS on load, or the on load, uh, for the UDP pack, the, for the ping pong and UDP packets, hmm. is, uh, you have like a tight loop because you had to pull or you had to have an interrupt. So do you set it up so that you would continue, you know, pulling? Yes. Or do you have your That's CPU? A good question. So the question is, in the, the round trip test, were we polling or were we using interrupts? And the answer is, for this example, we're using polling. Now, that is appropriate in some domains, and it's not appropriate in other domains. So what we're doing is we're saying, when the application invokes receive and the data isn't yet available, we will sit there in a tight loop calling stack poll over and over again for, we usually use 100 microseconds. And if the data arrives within that 100 microseconds, great, you haven't blocked. If it doesn't arrive, at that point, you go into the kernel, enable interrupts, and you block. And what that means is that one of the reasons that you're saving uh, time in this round trip test is not just because you're reducing overhead. It's also because you're cutting, up, cutting out the time that it takes to wake up and the, the time that it costs to process the interrupt. That isn't appropriate for all applications, but it is certainly for some, and particularly the HPC ones, which we'll come to in just a sec. Um, well, actually, the, so what, what, would, what would the effect be? Do you mean? Yeah. I, I mean, in terms of the, I'm trying to understand the difference between the polling and the interrupt. Right? Mm -hmm. so you're right. I mean, in some cases, if you're doing nothing, you combine the CPU to your polling. But if you have a very complex application where you, know, you have to receive messages, but you're doing other things for the CPU yeah. between, uh, then I would like to understand you know, the. So the, so the question is really about the trade off between when, when do you want to poll and when do you not want to poll? Mm -hmm. Well, the, if, if you enable interrupts and you don't have any interrupt moderation, then your, your round trip increases, um, in the onload case, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not absolutely sure, but it's probably a couple of extra microseconds on your, on your one-way latency, order of that. Um, in terms of when do we do polling, we have it available as an option which you can specify with an environment variable. And you can choose how long you want to poll for. And by default, we don't poll at all. And the reason for that is that we want good performance on multi-threaded apps. And if you've got a multi-threaded app, polling is a disaster, assuming that you've got work to do. Because if you have a thread sitting there polling, waiting for data in its socket, it's consuming CPU time that might well be usable by another thread that, that can make progress. So by default, we don't do it, because the apps we care about most are sort of enterprise apps, shall we say. You did use it there. I did use it here because I was trying to illustrate the round trip time. The people who care about round trip time are the people who are doing HPC type stuff. The enterprise apps don't really care about round trip time. They care about throughput of messages and transactions and that sort of stuff. So different application domains. You can do, but it doesn't make any difference. So, I mean, so I did, I did for this test. Yes, that's right. So, so wouldn't you be avoiding a lot of context switching then, which could be contributing more latency? Uh, um, I'm not sure I understand how. So you're falling, you're falling on the socket, which means you're not going to sleep and waking up. Right. Each time you get a packet, but if you're sitting there falling, then there's no context switch that ever occurred. You stay in that, in that user space. I think it would have to be because of the, it's going to be event driven, right? It'll right. In so, in, actually, in this, this number, both of these numbers come when you do a blocking receive. This number, in fact, both of these numbers barely change if you do non blocking receive. So, if you're going in and out of the receive, you add a tiny bit because there's a chance that the packet arrives at a point when you're not inside the receive code. So, whatever it costs to get from your application code, into the stack poll code, the, the code that actually looks at hardware events, that's the, very, that's the amount that you potentially add to your latency if you're doing non-blocking and polling it at the application level. However, the reason this guy won't generate much benefit or any benefit from that is that he's still got to wait for the cost of an interrupt to happen and all the stack processing, and that will be um, asynchronous with respect to what the application is doing. So the application is doing its 
pole in and out, in and out, all it's doing is looking at the receive queue of the socket in the kernel example. In the onload example, he would be going in and out, in and out, but whenever he looked at the receive queue, he would also call stack pole and have a look at the hardware queue. So for all the reasons that we've talked to, the, for all the reasons that we reduce overhead that we've talked about earlier, he gets the benefit of those, and this guy doesn't. In this case, the data path has still got to go through the interrupt service routine, even if you're polling. Now, there's no reason why the kernel stack couldn't be completely rewritten and totally adjusted and use a user-driven mechanism. And if they want to do that, that's fine by me. OK, so the, the final numbers I've got are just an example from the HPC world. So MPI is a message passing interface, and it's a standard API that lots and lots of HPC codes use to get their parallelism. And it's an abstract interface to communicate between processes. And their model is typically one process per CPU core, some on the same box, some spread over other boxes. And the particular characteristics of these applications is that they're generally speaking not multi-threaded. Um, they generally speaking expect to own the core. That is, you don't have to do anything else on the same core, except perhaps process hardware interrupts. Therefore, this is the classic example where polling is just fine. And if you want to do that, you can. And in fact, uh, some of the MPI implementations will do the polling for you, which is to say, we don't even need to do the polling ourselves in onload. The, the application itself will go in and out using non-blocking sockets. But the first thing I've got here is, is to show you the trade-off that you've got in the kernel stack between using interrupt moderation and not. So interrupt moderation says, I want a minimum, minimum interval between my interrupts, let's say 60 microseconds. So that means if an interrupt fires, another one can't happen for 60 microseconds. That means that you're never going to get a great round trip time. If you want the great latency, the lowest possible latency, you're going to have to turn interrupt moderation off. And that does give you the best latency, so that's this line down here. However, when you get to decent message sizes, your bandwidth suffers. So interrupt moderation off, best latency. Interrupt moderation on, best bandwidth. The next slides just compare the kernel stack with onload. And the kernel stack has been given interrupt moderation on in this case, so it gets the best bandwidth that it can. So really, it's doing the best that it can at this end of the curve. But onload, of course, wins across the board. It's getting the benefit of the lowest latency, and, and it's getting the benefit of the best bandwidth. And if onload happens to get itself into a mode where it's using interrupts, which, which it can do, depending on the application behavior, um, it'll also still benefit from interrupt moderation, because it, that algorithm's applied as well. In case you're wondering about the latency, um, the kernel stack, when it's got interrupt moderation off, is getting about 12 microseconds latency here, uh, sorry, versus the 60 or so that it's getting here. Whereas onload is getting application to application MPI latency of just over six microseconds. This is, uh, this is just like the, the round trip test that I talked about earlier. The only difference is that the message size is increasing. And this one is very similar, but they're sending data in both ways at the same time, so it's a bidirectional bandwidth test. One thing I haven't really had time to talk about much in this talk um, is scalability. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to, because there's an awful lot to talk about, and it really is a whole other talk. But there's one really obvious way in which this scales, which is if you've got separate applications and they're using separate stacks, then there's absolutely no crosstalk between them at all, and they'll scale beautifully across your course. But the architecture does scale very nicely across the cores, even if you do have a single stack shared by multiple threads. And the reason for that is that we can use the RSS algorithm that kernel stacks use to spread the load across the cores. And the way that the kernel does that is it spreads packets into multiple receive rings at the hardware level. And then each receive ring is handled on a separate core. But you've still got one stack, really. And so you still get a bit of crosstalk between the processing of those receive packets. What we would do is we have a stack per core. Essentially, the whole of the stuff that I've talked about, you replicate once per core. And therefore, there's pretty much no crosstalk at all, and it scales very nicely. I'm afraid that's all I've got time to say about scalability. <laughs>
So in conclusion, what we've done is improved performance, but remained completely compatible, we think, with everything out there. Now, of course, we have bugs, which means that you're bound to find application behaviors that trip us up. But whenever we find them, we fix them. But we're Ethernet. Everyone loves Ethernet for all of those reasons. We use the standard sockets, POSIX APIs, um, and we don't change the environment that the application is running in to the, to the extent that we possibly can. And finally, we're TCP IP. We don't ask for any exotic protocols on the wire. Therefore, you can stick on load on one end, get single-ended acceleration. You don't have to deploy it through your whole network. And we're releasing this as open source. So if you're at all interested in seeing how the code works, let us know, and we'll point you at the download. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Hello. Um, your test platform that you presented was a single socket system. That's right. And all the cores are sharing a cache level. Would you expect, what do you expect for differences in performance if you had a multi-socket system, either two socket or four socket system? So the question was, we've got a, we showed uh, as our benchmark system a single socketed uh, server. It's a single quad core. Um, it actually has two level two caches. It's, it's the Intel take two, two dual cores and stick them together solution. So we have actually got two caches in that example. There's no L3 in that architecture, no. Um, but the question really was, what changes when you go to a multi-socketed system, and how would that affect performance? The first thing is, um, you can get front-side bus limited in a single socket configuration. And that means you can't quite saturate both directions at once with a single socket. And what happens when you do that is, no matter how much CPU grunt you throw at it, you spend all of your time trying to suck data through a narrow pipe. And your CPU utilization goes up, and your performance doesn't. Um, so going to dual socket is a, a big advantage if your front side bus is limited. Um, in other respects, um, if you have an application that tends to share state um, between threads that happen to be running on different packages, then it will tend to be less efficient than if your application is clever enough to put things that happen together on the same cache. And that is true. There's nothing that we can do about that, shall we say. That, that's a problem that applies to any stack. Bob. So there was a, um, a lot of good stuff about how you share things in the kernel. One thing I missed is if I do a net step minus s, and I'm looking for statistics and TCP byte counts and retransmits and stuff, is there any kind of coordination between the kernel sockets and mm -hmm. your stuff? So the, the question really is, um, do our user level sockets get reflected in the standard system tools? So when you do netstat, will you see our sockets at user level as well as the sockets that are coming from the kernel stack? The answer is yes, and it's disgusting. I'm, I'm utterly ashamed of the way that we implement that. Um, we actually have to go into the proc file system where this stuff appears. And we insert a new proc file in place of the one that was already there. We sort of replace its entry in the directory, if you like, so we get it. We then query the original file and say, what are all the kernel sockets? And then add our own information about user level sockets to the end of that. So the user level tool sees all of them. So, so, sorry. So how confident are you about the isolation that the you know, user level could not do something to the data structures in the kernel where you could mess up the kernel? Uh, the answer is um, that is in progress and not 100% complete yet. And if you download the code, you will, you will be able to find examples where it's not complete. And I certainly wouldn't recommend that you take this and run it on an untrusted applications today. I believe it's doable. I believe it is possible to completely solve that problem. And the, re the real key to that, I think, is having a very formal layer, software layer, through which you access the shared state. Low-level primitives, and don't allow code to go around that. And make sure that those primitives are the point at which you're secure. When we compile for user level, those primitives will effectively be no-ops. All they'll do is 
add the indirect offset onto the base pointer and give you the pointer back. We don't particularly mind if user level destroys its state and then causes itself to segfault. The kernel, however, those little thin wrappers will turn into the, the techniques that I described earlier, where we apply a mask or a bounds check before we construct the pointer. What we don't do is we don't, we don't say, if bounds check good, do stuff else, um, follow error path. What we do instead is that we just guarantee that we will always return a pointer that points into the shared state. Yeah? Now, it may point at complete rubbish if the shared state has been corrupted, but it won't actually cause the kernel to fault. So you have to check every access? Every, every, every time we generate a pointer, we generate a check. So for example, if we're following a linked list of sockets, every time we get a number that says socket 5, we apply a mask to that number. That will generate a number that's in a range, a power of 2 range. We then look that up in a table in the trusted state. Every entry in that table is guaranteed to point somewhere in the shared state. Now we've got a pointer which is in the shared state. It's guaranteed to be far enough away from the end of the shared state that when you indirect into that data structure from that pointer, you'll always get a non-faulting address. So most of the accesses don't have checks. Creating pointers have checks. Okay. Bob. Uh, so the open. The openness is great, the user level access is great, but it's also sort of the bane of your existence, which is um, TCP stack protocol features, new um, options for TCP, things like going from uh, read and write to adding poll or e poll or other kinds of things. So you've got protocol things that need to change all the time, maybe, mm. that are not supported by the standard Linux community or MLS community, and you also may have syscall sort of sockety kinds of changes, same thing, right? So first of all, are people that you're talking comfortable with a parallel TCP stack, because that was seems to scare people. And the other is, what do you think about trying to keep this stuff live and useful and, and up to date? Um. So there are really two questions there. The, the first question is, how do we deal with evolution of the, the system call API and exciting new features? And the second one is, is a question really about how we're going to keep this thing going and what are we planning to do with it, I guess. So the, the first question, um, sometimes we don't have to do anything to, to cope with evolutions. So for example, we don't have to do anything at all to support select poll an epoll, except implement one of the file operations in the standard Linux struct file operations table. And there's a single call there called poll, which queries the state of a file descriptor in the kernel. And that's how select poll and epoll are all implemented using that one mechanism. And also um, async IO as well uh, can partly use that uh, implementation. Um, However, you don't get the best possible performance that way. So we do also intercept select and poll, although not yet epoll, we haven't done that yet, at user level and accelerate it at user level to get a further benefit. So the good news is some new features just happen, which is to say, if we can compile on that kernel version, then the feature will be there by virtue of the fact that we look like a kernel device as well as looking like a user level device. Um, and another example of that is send file. Uh, send file is done purely in the kernel just by implementing the send page file operation. So we don't, we don't have to do anything clever to do that. Um, and in fact, if you don't implement the send page operation, the kernel will use your write operation to do it itself slightly less efficiently. So that's good too. The second question is, um, how is this going to evolve and how do we keep it useful? We are actively working on it. Um, and as I say, we, we are releasing it as open source now. We're happy for you to download it and play with it. What we've not quite yet got is the resource to turn it into a sort of full community project. But that is our goal. That's where we're heading later this year. And at that point, what would be really helpful is to understand what applications people are really interested in, because that's where we can concentrate our effort in terms of validation and making sure that it's really robust for people. Because one of the problems that we found um, when we started doing this stuff is that the, 
the variety of behaviours that applications display are just mind-numbingly huge. And there are all sorts of socket options that you've never heard of until you uh, find that your application doesn't work and you dig in to try and find out why. One of the things that end users actually like when they try it is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a value add. And it doesn't, you know, it, it works, you get a bonus and you like it. If there's some strangeness about the application behavior that doesn't, they haven't lost it, because all they've invested in is just a PRP and Ethernet, which they already got. So there's no real downside to people playing with it. Yeah, and the other thing is that when we very first started doing this, um, we wanted it to be zero effort. Install our drivers, it'll just work. And that meant effectively accelerate by default. And that means we're exposed to the whole gamut of every application that might appear on a box. We think probably, although that was a very good exercise in terms of finding out what applications did, you can't possibly hope to see every application in, in our labs. So instead now, our approach is accelerate explicitly. You have to say, I want to accelerate that application. And by default, applications will just run over the kernel stack. The third is also the open time. And one of the, one of the purposes of having it failed was to kind of to an extended beta phase. Because you can get bumps of, actually, there's, there's, there's very there's quite definite groups of users with specific applications are going to get a benefit. They can see things of communities particularly. So we're trying to come up with some applications that would then qualify as this function correctly over the stack. So we have this ultimately a kind of an application matrix of sort of like qualified applications. And then outside of that matrix, you sort of move on your own. Any more questions? Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry, one more. Have you looked at any alternate uh, types of APIs which might of your mem-copy packs? Yeah, so the question is, have we looked at any uh, more other APIs that would get rid of mem-copy overheads? Um, the answer is that we're not interested in implementing anything non-standard, because we just want to plug in the underneath existing applications and just accelerate them. Obviously, we've thought about them, shall we say. Um, and there are other people who've been thinking about those things. Uh, Ulrich Drepper, the, the maintainer of the C library, I know he at a Linux in Otto Linux symposium a uh, year before last, he was talking about exactly that. I'm, I'm not aware that they've implemented anything along those lines yet. But essentially, the idea would be on the receive side, instead of the application saying, here's my buffer, put data in it, the, stack w the application would say, give me some data, and the, the stack would say, your data is here consume it from this buffer. And on the transmit side, OK, the application's got to say, here's my data. But that's actually not a disaster. One thing you can do on transmit is you can do zero copy if you arrange things right, particularly if you do async IO. But async IO is not something that's well supported in Linux uh, sockets, sockets um, and therefore no one uses it. If that became better supported by a decent API, then we would definitely do async IO, and we'd see, see probably a big benefit from it. So, another question. Yeah, Ulrich was on a crack in that presentation. He didn't know what he was talking about. In the meantime, he's gone back and done a lot more research, and he's wrote a very good paper that showed up on LWN.net, and I would refer people to that instead of his talk at OLS. Mm. Uh, Jazz Strong, a Google employee, ripped into him at that conference during the talk there, if you see the rest of the notes. <laughs> yeah, I was there. But uh, I, my, my, point, my point was simply that people are thinking about it. It's been proposed, but we, we're... We probably wouldn't build it into one load um, until it became something that the kernel supported. On the other hand, if people wanted to play with it and try it in on load, they could. And that'd be great fun. OK, thank you very much indeed.